Ta-da! So if I recall correctly, we are in, uh, this is Aviation History, Section 07. Does anybody know what part we're in? It's either 3 or 4, I can't recall. Okay, it's either part, it's part this is part 4? Okay, okay, so we finished part 3, and we finished this slide, if I recall correctly. Did I talk about incendiary bombing? I did? Okay. No? More people died in incendiary bombing in World War II than died from nuclear bombs. The United States and Great Britain in particular firebombed the city of Dresden in Germany, and more people died in Dresden. They people in this case, I mean non-soldiers, non-combatants. Same thing, the United States uh, firebombed Tokyo. Crazy. We killed more people in Tokyo from dropping incendiary weapons than we killed in Nagasaki and in Hiroshima combined. It's just in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, we just started, we'll drop one bomb each and wiped out the entire city all at once. All right. So I want to talk about a few significant aircraft from each of the big uh, aircraft manufacturing companies or manufacturing countries in World War II. In Germany, there was the BF-109, the FW-190, the ME-262, and the ME-163. Oh, yeah, that's right. Is anybody doing a report on any of these aircraft? No, nobody did. I Now that I recall, that was the first uh, essay that we did. In fact, speaking of essay, speaking of essay, I'll have all your essays back to you tomorrow. But I'm just thinking of, I'm looking at the syllabi for this class. Uh, we'll talk about essays tomorrow. All right, so the BF-109, you do not have to draw this picture on the test. You notice there's a nice cross on the side. It's a reasonably small airplane, but it's got one, two, three, four, five. I think it had a V-10 in it. But the power-to-weight ratio was really good. A lot of horsepower, small weight, very maneuverable. One of the two German biggest, best, not biggest, but two German best fighter planes. Then there was the FW-109. It was also reasonably small but very high power. And that's what you want out of a fighter plane. You want a really giant engine, and you want the rest of the airplane to weigh the least amount possible. And you want it to be able to pull a lot of Gs. That is, you want to be able to turn sharply and fly upside down and do loops and all kinds of other maneuvers. So it has to be very strong. And then, of course, you've got to put enough stuff on it. You've got to have, be able to shoot bullets out of it to knock down the other airplanes. In World War II, there were... Pretty, every fighter had machine guns, and it was very common to put them in the wings so that you didn't have to worry about synchronizing. And there was one or two airplanes that actually put cannons, small cannons, you know, like only one or two inches in diameter, which worked out great if you're aiming it at an enemy bomber. A cannon works out really good because you can knock it out. Two or three bullets might not do it. Here's the ME-262. The ME t so on those first two, the 109 and the FW-190, those were both German fighter planes. Very fast, very maneuverable. They were excellent fighter planes. The ME-262, I put it in here because the ME-262 was the first airplane that was powered by a jet to go into production and make a whole bunch of them. It wasn't the very first airplane ever to be powered by a jet because there were some prototypes where they just built one or two. But that's what's significant about the ME-262 is that it was the first production model of airplane that was powered by a jet. Now, this was built as a fighter jet. It has two engines. They actually hooked up a little gas gen gasoline generator in the front of it and hooked it up to get the engine to spin. And it was ridiculously fast. It was about 100 miles an hour faster than anything else flying at the time. It was about 100 miles an hour faster than anything else. Now, it was, it was a fighter plane, which means it was designed to be maneuverable and really fast and have machine guns. Hey, Josh, come on in. And, and shoot down other airplanes. There were two, there were three big problems with this airplane. Is number one, it didn't come out until later in the war. 
They didn't. They weren't able to build very many because by the time it started getting manufactured, we were bombing the snot out of German factories. So they were actually trying to build these in caves. I'm not making it up. There's some interesting documentaries out there. It was actually a lot of these were built by slave labor. I'm not making that up. As in captured people, mostly from Eastern Europe, like Romania and Czechoslovakia. Literally, they worked in manufacturing plants, including in the ME 262 plant. And then strate strategically, uh, the leader of Germany, Adolf Hitler, they were they were having a really hard time with the ground war in Europe. And he said, let's not use these to try to blow up the, the bomber planes coming in. Let's use them as ground attack airplanes, which it wasn't that they were that bad at it. I'm, I had to look to see if they could put bombs on it. But it wasn't enough. It, 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 that was not what this airplane was designed to do. They might have done better and prolonged the war, which was good for everybody. But it was, would have been really great if they had made enough of them, and then they could have shot down lots and lots of enemy fire bombers. Because in the daytime, that's what the United States was doing. We were taking off out of England, flying across Germany in the daytime. And even a P-51, this would smoke a P-51. Because it could go 100 miles an hour faster. So instead of 400 miles an hour, it would go 500 miles an hour. Which if you're fighting another airplane and you're 25% faster, that is huge. It would also climb faster so you could do whatever you wanted compared to another fighter jet. The ME-163, let's see if I got the right number. Yep, ME-163. The ME-163 was not the first airplane to be powered by a rocket, but it was the first airplane to go into production that had a rocket engine. And off the top of my head, I can't remember which, what two kinds of fuels there was. Uh, you have to have fuel and an oxidizer. I think the oxidizer was peroxide. Has anybody ever gone in the, uh, in the bathroom and seen a bottle of of hydrogen peroxide, that's only 3% hydrogen peroxide. The other 97% is water. But when the bubbles come off of it, it's oxygen. What if you took all the water out and it was 100% hydrogen peroxide? Hmm, hydrogen, hmm. Ox peroxide means two oxygen. You mix that with the fuel, it burns really fast. Really fast. So the problem, one of the downsides of this are was the they t sometimes they blew up when they were fueling them. I'm not going to go into too many details, but the wheels you see on here actually fell off of the airplane as that was a, a little like a like a wagon with two wheels on it. When it lifted off the ground, the wheels on the ground it had a skid. It was it turned the guy the engine only ran for about a minute or two, but it would climb up. I mean, literally, this thing would go literally like 20,000 feet a minute. So it was just like. Whoosh. It'd be right up there with the bombers, and it had, I believe it had machine guns, but I'd have to look that up. Shoot a bunch of bombers, if at all possible, and then they'd run out of fuel, and then they'd fly into what's called a dead stick landing. Dead stick landing means the engine doesn't work, so it glides, and it doesn't have really big wings, so it doesn't glide that great, but they'd land it and then do it again. But they built a bunch of these. It'd be fun to look up and see how many they built. So that's why this one is in here, is because it's the first production model airplane that was powered by a rocket. Can anybody name another production model airplane? Where they, let's just say they built more than 10. There is no. You could argue the space shuttle is a rocket-powered airplane, but they only built, even if you count the Enterprise, one, two, three, four, six. And one could argue that six is not really a production run. And the X-15, how many X-15s were built? I know somebody did a paper. Does anybody know? Did you look that up? I never looked it up how many X-15s were built. It couldn't have been more than three or four or five. So I don't consider any of those production models. All right. The A6M0 and the G4M Betty. If you watch a movie about Pearl Harbor, they usually what they usually did was take American airplanes and modify them to look like a Zero. Not that Zeros were the only airplanes used during the Pearl Harbor attack. But the Zero was Japanese, uh, the, the country of Japan's best fighter plane. And in fact, at the beginning of World War II, the Zero was better than anything the United States had in the Pacific. It was better than every fighter that the United States Navy had. It was faster and it was more maneuverable. 
The downside of the Zero is it had a lot of wood in it, and it had very little protection for the pilots against bullets. Can anybody name the company who ended, who made uh, Zeros? Yeah, say Mitsubishi. Huh? Yeah. I think they make cars now, and they make big industrial vehicles. Okay, so here's a picture of the A6M Zero. It was a fantastic airplane. They even flew these off of aircraft carriers. So it wasn't just the, the, the Japanese Air Force or Army Air Corps. It was also the Japanese Navy. Excellent visibility. And then the G4M Betty was what we would have called would have called back then a, a medium to heavy bomber. And they built a lot of G4M Bettys. And for the United States, can anybody name all the places that were owned by the United States during World War II that the Japanese attacked, that the Japanese dropped bombs on or shot bullets against? Pearl Harbor, yeah. So the territory of Hawaii on the island of Oahu, the harbor of Pearl. I don't know if anybody says that, Pearl Harbor. So that was one place. Can anybody name? There's one island that the Japanese actually took over in World War II for a short time. I'll give you a hint. It was in the Pacific Ocean. And it was a really small island. And I don't remember the name. And it was in, it was in the Aleutian chain off of uh, Alaska. The Aleutian chain. They took over one of those islands. We took it back. In any case, so we didn't have a lot of A, correction, G4 and Bettys flying over the United States. But that bomber was used a lot in the Asian War, in Indonesia and micro, see, Indonesia, Malaysia, Guam, the Marshall Islands, Iwo Jima. Well, there's a whole list. All right. I like the British names because they have names. They... They don't, don't have numbers. The Hurricane, the Spitfire, the Mosquito, and the Lancaster. Just so you know, these, these airplanes are all my opinion as to which are the most awesome uh, airplanes of each country. But I'm writing the test, yes? Yeah, so there would be a test question. It would be like, name, name five of the four most significant British aircraft during World War II that Mr. Johnson likes. And that way you'd, everybody would get one wrong because you'd write down a name of some British airplane and I'd say that wasn't on the list. And you'd get the other four right. I, I personally, I, I think the first time I ever saw a movie about that had British World War II uh, airplanes in it was about the Mosquito. So that's actually one of my favorite airplanes. The Mosquito in, out of Great Britain, it's actually made out of wood. And it's got two Merlin V-12s. So that's like two P-51s glued together. First, we'll look at a hurricane. So the Hawker Hurricane and the Spitfire were the two fighter planes, those first two fighter planes. Those were the ones that were used in the Battle of Britain to keep Germany from invading Great Britain. So that's the significance of those two. They were also the two best, fastest fighter planes that, the, that Great Britain had. So they were the fastest, most maneuverable, and they're the ones that won literally the Hurricane and the Spitfire won the Battle of Britain. So here's a picture of the Spitfire. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it had a Merlin V-12 supercharged engine in it. This is, this is not one from World War II because I'm looking at the, the helmet this person is wearing, and that is not a World War II helmet. You notice there's actually a bump on top of the airplane there by the windshield shield. That's actually a mirror. You notice the back of the airplane is in the way, so if the, the pilot turned backwards, it's hard to see. So literally, they put a mirror so you could literally so you could look for airplanes coming up behind you. I'm not making that up. So here's the Mosquito. Yeah, so let's put two engines in it. Of course, I also like it because this one had a Navigator Bombardier in it, and I'm kind of partial to Navigators and Bombardiers. And it was a light bomber, uh, but it had machine guns in it. You could shoot down other airplanes. There's a couple of good movies about World War II with mosquitoes where they drop bombs on dams and stuff like that. And, of course, lots of people died. And not that that's the fun part. I didn't mean it that way. 
And then here's the Avro Lancaster. This is the equivalent of a B-17. If you looked at the bombers during bombing Europe in World War II, for the biggest chunk from 43 to the end of the war, the British flew night missions over Europe, and they did, they did not take fighter escort with them. That was a downside of the hurricane and the, and the, and the uh, Spitfire, is they had limited range, and they never fixed that. So Great Britain at night, they would fly their bombers like this Avro Lancaster, and it's got four Merlin V-12s on it. So it's like four uh, Spitfires glued together. I think they did something besides just glue, maybe a couple of bolts. But uh, they would fly at night and drop incendiaries on the cities, or they'd also try to drop bombs on parts of the cities that had industry. It's just hard to aim that well if things aren't lit up. And the United States and Europe, that is, was flying B-17s. We had radial engines, round engines on B-17s, but it was a very equivalent bomber. More, about half of the people on this airplane were, were machine gun operators. You have a pilot, a co-pilot, a navigator, a bombardier, maybe a radio operator, and then you'd have three, four, five gunners. Same thing on a B-17. A pilot, a co-pilot, a navigator, a bombardier, a radio operator, and then three, four, five gunners. It's hard to tell in this picture, but there is actually a gun in the very tail of the airplane because that's the easiest way for a fighter to shoot you down is to just come up behind you because bombers flew about 1 to 200 miles an hour slower than the fighter planes. Like a B-17 couldn't even go 300 miles an hour. But the Falk Wolf and the, uh, the FW and the, uh, the BF, they could go almost 400 miles an hour. So they could go at least 150 miles an hour faster than the bombers. Wow! Name eight of the six most significant airplanes built in the United States during World War II. So I'll give you a moment to write that down, and then I'll tell you the parts on each one that I like the most. And don't get me wrong, there's tons of airplanes. I'm sure if you got somebody just like me, who'd been flying for a while and had some interest in World War II history, they'd come up with a different list. And probably half of them or more of the airplanes would overlap. But like, for instance, uh, well, I'll let you write. So you might not notice, but those first two airplanes up there are airplanes that flew in the Navy. And then the rest of them are Army Air Forces, or the Army Air Corps. Oh, man, I didn't, I didn't capitalize the F in Flying Fortress. I mean, that's a good name, right, Flying Fortress? Then there was Super Fortress. And then there was Strato Fortress. Oh, wait, no, missed one. Another one in there. There's, super, there's Flying Fortress, Super Fortress, Strato Fortress. There was one before the Strato Fortress. Oh, shucks. Now I can't remember. Does anybody know off the top of their head what they call the B-47? It wasn't like Jet Fortress. The Hellcat was made at the near the end of the war. The Hellcat was the first airplane the Navy, and that's what I was going to say about it, so thank you for that segue there is that the thing that I think is significant about the F-6F, it was the best fighter plane that the Navy fielded during World War II. There was one that came out just before the end, but it didn't really see much combat. It was better than the Zero. It was better than the Zero. But see, some people would say, well, why didn't you put the F-4U Corsair? Because the F-4U Corsair was better than the Zero as well. The Marines flew it more than the Navy did, although the Navy flew it. But they made more F-6Fs. And there was a whole line of Grumman airplanes, the, uh, the, the Hellcat and the, shucks, I can't remember which cat. They kept all the way up to the F-14, and if you've seen Top Gun, the F-14 is a Tom Cat. The Navy was naming their Nipkins fighter after cats. So I have a picture of the F-6F Hell, uh, Hellcat. So this thing could climb faster. It could had a better forward speed. I'm not sure how much more maneuverable it was than the Zero. Maybe it wasn't a whole lot. I don't recall. 
But this is pretty close to the best thing the Navy came up with in World War II. And once it was in there, pff, later days, if there was an air combat between an F-6 F Hellcat and a Zero, the Zero usually lost. Here's the Dauntless. The reason I put the Dauntless, and you can, again, you can see the person in the front with a uh, helmet on, and they didn't wear plastic or fiberglass helmets in World War II. Notice the person in the back is either a short person or down because it's cold because of the wind. But you notice they have a, a twin machine guns. The Dauntless was a torpedo bomber. You're going to write that down. The Dauntless was a torpedo bomber. I'm not going to go into the Battle of Midway, but the Battle of Midway occurred after Pearl Harbor, and the Battle of Midway was where aircraft carriers on both sides, the United States side and the Japanese side, fought each other, and all of the fighting was done with airplanes flying to the other side. And the United States barely won that battle. I think we lost one aircraft carrier and had heavily damaged one. I can't remember exactly. They had one or two seriously damaged and two or three uh, sunk. And it was the dauntless torpedo bombers. I won't go into the details, and I don't know the exact numbers, but the United States and Japan launched lots of airplanes against each other. And part of why we won that battle is because we found them before they found us. They weren't expecting us, and we figured we were expecting them. And then we, we outlaunched them, and we actually sh uh, blew up some of their aircraft carriers before they could get their torpedo bombers off the deck which is one of the reasons why we won that battle. But if you look up, and I don't know the exact numbers, but way it was, it was something like three-fourths of the Dauntless torpedo bombers in that battle were shot down. Not 10%, not 50%, but it was like three-quarters of them. And it also means the, the two men in each one of these airplanes usually died because they got shot down right in front of the aircraft carrier. I'm not saying war is fun. I did, if it's coming across that way, my apologies. So that's why I think the Dauntless is a significant airplane in World War II because the very first battle of aircraft carrier to aircraft carrier was done all by airplanes, and this was the airplane that won that battle for the United States. Then, of course, this is a nice, shiny P-51 Mustang. This one is... Uh, is a restored one. They actually extended the cockpit and the plexiglass on this one. There's actually a seat in the back. They didn't make two-seater ones back then. Uh, it doesn't have flight controls in the back. You just They just made it so you could have a passenger. People argue about what was the best fighter plane. Most of the time, the argument gets won by the P-51 because it was more maneuverable, faster, and could climb higher than everything else in the sky. If you want to say, name one of the significant reasons why the United States won the war in Europe, it was because we had a boat ton of bombers that flew past enemy lines and destroyed the, the Germany ability to make by blowing up their factories and their train yards and their gasoline refineries and stuff like that. That strategic bombing is where you destroy the, the country's ability to make war. And the reason we could do it in the end is because we had P-51s that had enough range, even with drop tanks on the outside of the airplane, to fly all the way in and fly all the way back, and they could escort the bomber the entire, the entire round trip. And it was the P-51 that did a big chunk of that. There was the P-40, well, not the P-40, no, what was, uh, oh, 47, rather, did a lot of that, too. Um, if you're familiar with the Tuskegee Airmen or the Red Tails, they flew P-51s. They did a really good job. Of course, the gentlemen who were flying in that in that unit uh, had something to prove, So, uh, and they did. Uh, in any case, I think the P-51 was the best fighter plane in World War II. I'm sure somebody has a different opinion, and they have data to support it. But they're not writing the test. So here's the B-17. This is the equivalent of uh, Avro Lancaster's four-engine job. These had radial engines, round engines, instead of uh, V engines. You'll notice, what I'd like you to notice on this one is try to count the machine guns. So it uh, looks like there's a couple on the nose under the bottom, and then there's another one in the nose, in the plexiglass. If the bombardier wasn't bombing, the bombardier manned that gun. Then you'll notice on top, just behind where the pilots sit, there's two machine guns there. 
it's hard to notice, but way, 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 way in the tail, there was a small human back there. They had two machine guns. One, what's hard? Uh, halfway between, uh, just before, in front of the empennage, there's one on each side. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, wait, and this one, I just forgot about it. If you look up near the front where it says Screaming Eagle, you can see there's a machine gun on the side of the airplane. There was probably one on the other side. Okay, you're in battle. Do you really care if the radio operator is talking on the radio? No, you'd probably rather have the radio operator operating a machine gun. So they actually designed it, and it's not just the B-17, but it was all the bombers, most of the bombers, the big bombers in World War II. They designed them to fly close in formation so that they would position the other airplane to where uh, there was no good coverage from machine guns. So that if an airplane flew down, you'd, ha you'd have to hit, get hit by machine guns off of one airplane before you could get into the right spot to go get another airplane without a machine gun being able to aim at you. So it was very important, if you ever watch a World War II movie about bombing, they're always talking about staying in formation and staying tight, because if you lose, get out of the formation, then enemy bom uh, fighters can come in and shoot you down a bit easier. And, of course, that's what happens when you leave the formation, because you have some, cause something happens, then the enemy fighters all gang up on you and blow you out of the sky. So you don't have to write this down, but uh, the United States was bombing with B-17s out of Europe, out of England in 1943, and I think I mentioned it before, that if you were a United States Marine Corps invading force in, in, uh, south, in the South Pacific, you were actually less likely to die in combat than if you were a crew member on a B-17. It wasn't until the P-51 uh, the P-51 showed up and they could actually escort the bomber all the way that our losses weren't terrible. Literally, most people in 1943 who were flying bombers didn't hit 25 missions. They died. Because at 25 missions, you could go home. Here's the B-24 Liberator. It's an extremely similar airplane to the B-17. And the reason I put it up here is because it's, A, it's not as famous as the B-17, but B, we made more of these than any other bomber in the war. In fact, we made more B-24 Liberators than any other airplane during the war. And we made them at three or four factories. Ford Motor Company. Has anybody ever heard of Ford trucks? Ford Mustangs. Ford built about a third of these. A giant factory from scratch. It was called Willow Run. And there are pictures on the Internet. You type in Willow Run bombers or Willow Run Ford uh, manufacturing plant. And you'll see lots of pictures. It's like it, it's like a quarter mile long. It, it's like they, the airplanes get smaller and smaller and smaller on the assembly line because there are so many inside of a building at once. They were building like 20, 30, 40, 50 at once. In any case, it would go about as far, and it had a lot of machine guns on it. And I think it's, it's awesome or more awesome than the B-17. Uh, it, it was actually a little bit faster than a B-17, and it would hold a little bit more fuel. But it was designed a couple of years later, which would make sense. And then, of course, my personal favorite airplane of World War II is the B-29. So I'm going to talk about the B-29 and its significance. Number one, it was a pressurized airplane. Number two, it was the biggest airplane ever built on this planet at the time when it was built. Number three, we only used them in the Pacific we used them a lot in the Pacific after we took over a hold of Guam and the Marshall Island. This thing off out of Guam and fly all the way to Japan and fly all the way back. This is before anybody was doing aerial refueling than just as an experiment. Uh, you'll notice it's kind of hard to see with the light on, but you can see the machine gun turrets don't have plexiglass. It's because they were all fired by remote control. You can actually see in the middle of the fuselage near the back of the airplane are plexiglass bubbles, and there's a plexiglass bubble on the top. That's where the gunner sat, and that's where they operated the machine guns. So everybody was on the inside. It was pressurized. That was the downside of all these other bombers is you had to have holes where the machine guns were, especially the waste gunners, and it got really cold. So now everybody could, and you had to wear oxygen masks because you were up past 20,000 feet. So, you know, the United States, why did the United States win the wars? Because we could outproduce all the other countries combined. And we were, of course, knocking out 
uh, the ability of Japan and uh, Germany to make their own weapons. Uh, and, of course, the biggest significance of the B-29 is a B-29 is the first airplane to drop a nuclear bomb. We dropped one in Hiroshima, and then a few days later, the United States dropped a bomb on Nagasaki. And they were really, relatively speaking, they were l small bombs, like the 20, 30 kiloton range. When I say kiloton, kilo is a thousand, so a thousand tons. And it's not that the bomb weighed 20,000 tons, it's that it had the equivalent explosive power of 20,000 tons of dynamite. Think about a, a 100 kiloton bomb. So that would be 100,000 pounds of dynamite. And then think about a one megaton nuclear bomb. That's a, the same explosive force as a million pounds of dynamite. I can't even imagine a million pounds of dynamite. And that explosive force is not even taking into account radioactivity, which you can kill a lot of people from radioactive fallout. Things get blown up in the bomb and now it's radioactive, and when you breathe it in, that radioactivity is inside of you, pow, you get cancer. And not like in six months, I mean today. And you get it really bad. So one way, if you want to kill lots of people after the bomb goes off, is you'd have the bomb blow up after it hit, have it touch down on the ground. And then when it blows up, it throws up tens and tens of thousands of pounds of radioactive dirt. And then people will breathe that in. Or you have it blow up 500 or 1,000 feet, and you kill more people instantly because the, the shock wave and the flame and stuff will get to you right then. But say if it's 1,000 feet above the ground, it doesn't throw up as much dirt, so you don't get as much radioactive fallout. So you want to kill people more now, or you want to kill people more later? Of course, the advantage of blowing it up 1,000 feet up, you tend to knock all the buildings for miles, just get knocked down or burned. So if you're trying to destroy the industry, and that's what the United States did, those two nuclear bombs, we had them blow up before they got to the ground because we were trying to destroy. We weren't, it's not that we weren't trying to kill people, but we were trying harder to just flatten those cities so there was nothing left in an attempt to scare the snot out of the Japanese government. Because Japan, do you think Japan had any idea how many nukes we had? No, there was no way for them to know. So there were three nuclear weapons built in World War II. The two we dropped, one was named Fat Man, the other one was named Little Boy. But we blew one up in the United States in Los Alamos, New Mexico first, about a month or so before we dropped one on Japan, just to see if it would work. So the first nuclear explosion on the planet was not at Hiroshima. The first nuclear explosion on the planet was in Los, uh, maybe it was Alamogordo. Pardon me? Yes, the Manhattan Project is the name of the entire project about building nuclear weapons. And I could, I could talk here and talk about the Manhattan Project. But the Manhattan Project built three bombs. Fat Man Little Boy, which we dropped on Japan, and the first one, it was called The Gadget. And the site of the explosion was called the Trinity Site. And they put it up on a tower that was several hundred feet up and blew it up. Because they wanted to know how much oomph and would it work. And that's a whole you could spend you could spend a three college credit class just on the proliferation of nuclear weapons starting in nineteen forty I bet you I've got 17 more slides after this one, so don't get your hopes up. There's only just one just like that. So in World War One, I'll give you a minute to write that down, and then I'll, uh, and then I'll tell you the good stuff the extra to write down. See, I could give you commentary that you don't have to take notes while you're writing things down. So here, I'll give you commentary on something that's not in the book. I mean, not. You don't have to. 
How come it takes war for the for the planet to develop technology in aviation? What's that? Because we're willing to spend more money during a war. I believe that's 100% correct. So how come we're willing? So that leads to a fun question. So how come we're willing to spend more money if it means that we get to kill more people? What's that? So we can win is the answer. Okay. Well, what does it get you when you win? I, I'll, I'll answer the first part. If you win, that means you get to write the history books. It means you get to tell the other people what they get to do. You don't have to write this down, but the United States, over after the war, we took over Japan. This, a plan was put together by a gentleman named Marshall. It was called the Marshall Plan. And the leading Army General, General MacArthur, who was in charge of uh, the battle in the Pacific, he actually moved to Japan, and he was effectively the dictator of Japan for a couple of years or so. And they, we, we, <clears throat> we, the United States, wrote a constitution for the country of Japan. Interestingly enough, the constitution of Japan right now is that uh, you don't get to own firearms in Japan unless you're a police officer or have a special permit. And that portion of the Constitution is still in place in Japan. So if you go to Japan, you don't take your weapons there. And if you're living in Japan, you don't get to own a firearm. What's that? That's why they have swords. Well, okay, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I lived I was stationed on the island of Guam when I was in the Air Force. And it, there, it was a minor, minor tourist attraction citizens, and they would come to play golf, because golf is really expensive in Japan, because land is expensive, and they would go to the gun, they had these gun ranges where you could go and shoot guns, including machine guns, and they would go scuba diving, and they would lie on the beach. I know, who could ask for anything more? Ah, let's see, you can shoot guns, you get to play golf, you get to go scuba diving, you get to lie around on the beach, sounds like a pretty good time, and it's cheaper than going to Hawaii, because Guam is a lot closer. And the prices are not as high as they are in Hawaii. So, in World War I, let's take a look at this first one, this air power. In World War I, air power was, I don't know if it was even secondary. It was probably tertiary or quaternary. That means it was the third most important or the fourth most important, maybe even the fifth most important. We were still hauling stuff around in World War I with horses and wagons. They had barely invented tanks. There were only a few tanks. And let's face it, the biggest airplane they built in World War I would only hold about five or eight people completely. Or it had two or three people and it could carry a few bombs. It had a couple of, couple of engines. In World War II, on the other hand, everything changed. Navy, we've already covered that, naval, naval battles turned into air battles. They weren't battleships with big cannons shooting ba other battleships with big cannons. And we used airplanes, and so we used airplanes in Europe to destroy the enemy's ability to make war. And I'm not trying to knock the importance of tanks and the army and the marines and the navy. I don't mean it that way. But if you could fly over the battlefield and then go blow up all the factories, you know, in a few months, no more material could get to the front lines. So if you shot up somebody's tank, they couldn't replace it. So if air power went from a secondary to a primary method of battle, then number two is very obvious there, air superiority. Air superiority, I'll tell you what air superiority means, you can fly around in that area and the bad guys can't shoot you very easily. So that's what the P-51s did flying across Europe, escorting the bombers. We maintained air superiority because we had more fighter planes in the air than they could put up in the air. So we had control of the air. So that's really what air superiority means. In fact, that's what we did with Japan. By the time we got to Japan in the Pacific, there were not that many fighter planes left. And... We could fly, we had air superiority over the country of Japan, and we were using it. Barely, we barely had air superiority in the Battle of Midway. Okay, already talked about naval battles becoming air battles. Strategic bombing, this is the way you win the war. 
This is the way you. This is the way we. The United States won the war in Europe because we blew up Germany's ability to make more war supplies, whether it was tanks or engines or airplanes or railroads or guns or bullets. We, that's strategic bombing, and we did that in Japan. We just dropped nukes so that we could win the war faster. Now, granted, don't get me wrong, it's not that the United States was not also targeting civilians on purpose by firebombing Tokyo. I'm, I'm not saying that we didn't do that. We did, in fact, do that. Let's just say half, let's just say half of all the war supplies in World War II were being built near, in or near Tokyo. And you killed everybody in Tokyo. Half of the factory workers in the entire country. So I'm not saying valid reasons to kill civilians in World War II. I'm just trying to point out that we didn't just try to kill people in uniform with guns. Okay, leading edge aircraft technology. Look, man, we we had an airplane, a B-29, that we could fly from Guam all the way to, to, to Japan and back without refueling. Awesome. One could argue that the war would have gone on a lot longer if we didn't have B-29s, if the United States didn't have B-29s. The war would have gone on probably another six months, and I'm making that number up. I don't really know. Technology, that's how we ended up winning the naval battles. It's because we ended up with better than the other side did. Of course, here's I don't have it on this slide, but the United States built more of all that stuff. We didn't have EB-29s going to Japan every day. We had one or two hundred going every day, and then the next day the other half of them would go, and then the next day. I don't know. It would be fun to look up how many B-29s were actually flew over Japan on any one day. What if everyone can 10,000 pounds of bomb? Let's make it not say 5,000 pounds of bomb. 1,000 times 5,000. That's a five with six. That's six million pounds of bombs in a day. Remember, I can't, if that was all TNT, I can't, I can't even think about what a million pounds of TNT is like. So that was the equivalent. Of, and those bombs, I'll just let you know, those bombs are about half, half metal and explosive. So let's say it was five million pounds of bombs. That's only two and a half million pounds of TNT. That's like two and a half one megaton nuclear bombs. No radiation. Still a lot of explosive. Could you imagine that? Two, two and a half million pounds of bombs going off in your country, as small as Germany, every day. So now you can start thinking about, yes, when you say the U.S. bombed the snot out of Germany, that is an accurate statement. It's kind of hard to maintain the railroads and build tanks and build airplanes when two and a half, and I'm making that number up. I know there was more days, there was plenty of days that we sent at least 1,000 airplanes over, but I made that number up. I don't know if there's 5,000 pounds of bombs in an airplane. But still, even if it was half of that, it'd still be 1.25 megatons a day. I'm not trying to tell you all this because it's exciting. I think it's exciting and interesting because it makes me realize what things that we have done, not just the United States, but we as humans have done to other humans. And if we don't think about it now, then the next time something like this comes up, we'll still not be thinking about it. So just for fun, if the United States and North Korea go to the war, you think we're going to start off our attack with the United States Marine Corps and tanks and helicopters? You're not, we're not going to, Navy's not going to run up there with a bunch of amphibious assault vehicles, and the door's going to pop out, and we're going to drive out Humvees, and we're going to launch helicopters with guns, and Marines are going to run with their guns in the beach on the water. You don't think we're going to do that? What do you think we're going to do, Luke? 
I know you're, you're a strategic military uh, strategist, strategic strategist. If you, if you were the United States and you wanted to destroy, let's just say you wanted to destroy the military capabilities of that country, what weapons do you have at your disposal in the United States that you could use? And that maybe we haven't talked about what weapons the United States has. Think about that on the way home because class is over. Jonathan, I need... I need a number for you to you to write down that I can post your grades by. Any any five digit or greater number you need. Can I get your name and a five digit number? I want to post your grade. I need a number. You can use a number you already have. My request is that you write it down somewhere so you know. No, I want a number. Yes, I want you to write down your name. I want you to write down a number and I, so I can post your grades.